All right, hello everyone. Um, Sam as the stream coordinator here, just popping in to say uh, hello, welcome, and thank you for uh, popping into the workshop. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Have some technical difficulties tonight, so uh, pardon the minor hiccups. Um, so as the workshop coordinator, uh, yes, uh, hello, welcome. Um, just wanna do a little bit of housekeeping before we jump into the workshop itself. Uh, the first of which being that we will not be having a workshop next month because of the holidays. Um, obviously, we're cutting it very close to many people's Thanksgiving celebrations. And then in December, we would be um, cutting into all of the festivities in that last week. So we're just going to skip the workshop and we'll be back in January for at least the workshop uh, component of Rock Game Dev's uh, normal monthly broadcasting. Um, other than that, we are also looking for lightning talk speakers, probably for um, February or March of 2021. So if you are interested in a roughly five to 10 minute talk, so something on a, on a very small scale, uh, and you're and interested in giving a uh, lightning talk that would probably be digital still, um, impossible to know what the world's gonna be like, but for the foreseeable future, we'll continue to be digital. Uh, please do reach out to me on Discord, um, or via email, uh, my information will be at the bottom of the workshop today. Um, also, I will be watching chat here. Um, Noah, our stream coordinator, will also be watching chat. So if you have any questions about workshops, about today's specific workshop content, any of that, please feel free to drop it in chat uh, or ping us afterwards on the Rock Game Dev Discord. I think that's all the housekeeping I had today. Um, if you have any other questions about Rock Game Dev in general, um, and you don't want to ping someone individually, obviously, please feel free to check out our website, rockgamedev.com. Uh, all right, that brings us to the workshop itself. So normally this is where I introduce the workshop uh, presenter, and that's me. So hello, everyone. Sam, uh, as your workshop presenter for the day here. Uh, today I want to talk about just some of the foundations of production it would be impossible to talk about everything, and uh, I didn't want to bite off more than I could chew, specifically because part of today's conversation is around scope. So this is something of a, a mini talk, uh, a mini workshop, and we're just going to dive right in. Um, before I actually get started on the content of the talk, uh, I want to encourage you as soon as right now or before uh, to please send any questions you have about games production, project management, all of that good stuff uh, in the chat. I want to you know, answer as many questions as I can, as many as we can get to uh, after the talk. And because we are on the delay of a uh, live stream, uh, the sooner we get those questions, the better. So we'll go through them at the end. So to start off, uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, if you haven't seen me before, this is me. Uh, I graduated in uh, May from RIT after studying games production at SOIS, um, which is the School of Individualized Study. So I kind of got to craft my own uh, undergrad program around games production. Um, that was kind of informed by my experience starting uh, Aesthetician Labs, a game studio with Noah Ratcliffe and Aiden Markham, both of whom you've probably seen around the community if you don't know them personally. Um, I have been the producer at Aesthetician Labs pretty much since we started. Although the definition of being a producer for Aesthetician Labs has changed over the years. Um, and just obviously the um, quick disclaimer that I am maybe a relative expert uh, within certain communities, but I am certainly not capital A, capital E, an expert. Uh, my thoughts and best, best practices still change all the time as I'm learning more, uh, both from reading, from talking with uh, industry veterans, from feedback from my team. Um, so this is kind of the state of my knowledge and my expertise currently. Uh, it is subject to change and uh, yeah. So today, the, the kind of scope of our talk today, uh, I really want to touch on the Iron Triangles, the foundation of project management and therefore production, uh, but then also talking about organization because staying organized is definitely a key part of project management uh, and production on the whole. So within the Iron Triangle, if you're unfamiliar, we're going to talk about scope, resources, and budget, and balancing the three. 
And then we're going to talk about uh, the what and the how of organization primarily. So we're not going to cover a lot of other things. Um, some of these will have resources at the end. Some of them you may just uh, have good luck finding uh, resources on your own. But obviously, uh, please do feel free to follow up with me if you want more specific resources that I don't list at the end. Uh, but things we're not going to be covering. Uh, different specific production methodologies like Scrum, Lean, Kanban, etc. Uh, there's entire books, there's entire uh, courses in universities and such on these. Um, it would be so much to even skim through all of them or most of them in a talk. Uh, so we're just not going to cover them at all today. Uh, we're not going to talk about negotiation and conflict resolution or team management specifically getting funding, finding your team, starting a company, so, so many things that I think are really integral parts of production. Not to say that any of these aren't important, but just to say that I don't have the resources today to talk about them, uh, both in time and energy. So do feel free to ask questions about them, um, but they just won't be integral parts of the presentation themselves. So starting with your iron triangle. Here we have a nice triangle. Um, up at the top, obviously, there is a scope. That is your, your features, your functionality. Your scope of your game is the major components that actually make your game a game. Uh, being able to fly you know, a feature um, or a functionality. Um, these are essentially the tasks, the building blocks of your end product. Uh, bottom left, we have resources. So resources are your budget and the cost of your game, but they're also your human resources. Who do you have on your team? How many hours does each of those people have to work on this project? Um, depending on what size company you're at, how your company is structured, you might have 10 people, but each of those people might only have part time on your project. Uh, and lastly, uh, in the bottom right, you have your schedule. So that is um, how long do you have to get your game done or get a certain feature done? Um, and what priority are, do your different features and functionalities fall into? You know, maybe getting moving is a lot higher priority than your sound effects and your music. Um, so this is kind of the foundation of your iron triangle. Um, the idea being that within this blue triangle here, you're always going to be somewhere, but your focus, your primary focus, if it's too far into any of these corners, Will become a problem because you start to sacrifice the other two. Um, we'll talk a bit about that. So starting with scope, being your features, your functionality. Every feature and function costs resources and takes time to complete. So if you're familiar with the idea of scope creep, which I know we we're talking about in chat a little bit, um, scope creep being that when you start working on a game, you have so many ideas. The idea space for what your game can turn into is massive. And it's really easy, especially as a game progresses, to say, okay, we want to go from A to B. That is the game. But ooh, what if there was a side quest? What if we added this extra area at the end for people who do really well? Um, you start to tack on features, functionalities, um, any sorts of work that needs to be done essentially that starts to pile on as a result of working on your project. Um, this can be really, really hard to mitigate, I think, especially for indie teams who are kind of doing it all themselves, doing it in-house. It gets really hard not to become overexcited about your game in a way that hurts your scope. Um, please do pardon if I like sound really clinical when talking about my game, um, but part of production is, I think, a little bit being removed. So. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more at the end, but um, part of having one's producer hat on is uh, understanding that scope creep is a bad thing, even if you really like all the features that are a part of it. Um, so going back to this iron triangle, you'll see that if I'm, is my cursor showing on here? No. Okay. So you can't see my cursor, but I'm uh, circling up around the, the scope corner of this triangle, right? If our project is so high up there that we are, our scope is really inflating, it's really gonna hurt our other two. It's really gonna hurt our resources and it's really gonna hurt our schedule. Um, so that being why you want to mitigate, mitigate that scope creep. Um, a really good 
kind of core tenet of mitigating that scope creep is to develop is to develop a strong vision of the core of your game, the most important features and functionalities that need to be there for the players to experience what it is you want them to see. Um, obviously, when uh, the scope cuts happen in your late game because you need to meet your resources and your schedule where they're at, um, having a good idea of the core tenets of your game will leave you in a much better place to know what can be cut without losing that core experience. Um, so that brings us to the other two parts of the triangle, your resources and your schedule. So your resources being obviously, again, your team and then uh, your finances. Depending on the position that you as production or your team are in, finances might not actually be a factor um, or your team might fluctuate without your direct control. HR might come in and say, sorry, this person needs to work on another project now. Um, so resources can be a little bit harder to control depending on the situation, um, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be planned for and kept in mind. Um, especially because if resources are low, which can easily happen if you're not kind of keeping them in mind during the planning of your project, um, schedule and scope may need to cut corners uh, in order to deliver your product at all. Um, if resources are abundant for you, if you have funding coming in left and right and more than enough people to work on your project, uh, I applaud you. I am very excited for you, um, but that's a super uncommon position to be in. Um, I think especially in the hobbyist indie space, um, I've certainly never experienced it. And more often than not, you hear stories of people who are sparse on resources, whether that's usually finances, but uh, can also be team. Um, obviously, like I mentioned earlier, um, today we won't be talking about things like getting funding and finding your team. So the specifics of managing and accumulating resources uh, is a whole talk in and of its own. Um, so then that third element is your schedule, your time, uh, and I think one of the lesser talked about parts of schedule being your priority. Um, things, tasks, uh, features, functionalities always take longer than planned, uh, unless you're planning and buffering, even then sometimes they can take longer than is planned. And getting them done on time can be really hard, but as production or as a producer, um, that becomes a really high priority because that's your job, is making sure things can get done as much as possible on time. And when they can't, that you know where your schedule can be flexible. Um, a really wonderful part of um, sticking to your schedule, really useful element in making sure that you can do that is knowing the priority of your tasks. And this isn't something I kind of learned until later, but knowing what priority your work should be done in will help you to cut features at the end if you need to cut them in order to keep to your schedule. Um, because cutting your scope back is one of the easiest to control variables between your schedule, your resources, and your scope. So that's kind of the overview of the three of these, but in talking about the relationship between them, um, your scope must be small enough that you can get it done given the resources and schedule you have. You must have enough resources to meet that intended scope and in do so in the scheduled time. And you must have, uh, to meet your schedule, you must have enough resources and limit your scope. So as I was kind of alluding to earlier, if you get too far into any of the corners of this triangle, you start to sacrifice on the other two. Um, but it's a lot easier to control for sacrifice on something like scope than it might be on uh, resources or schedule. Um, when you start to sacrifice on schedule, that's when you start to see crunch. And um, it is a core tenant of mine that, that we should not crunch, we should not need to crunch. And so that is um, depending on who you are and kind of your philosophy on producing games, um, that may or may not be an option for you. Um, but scope is the easiest way to also take care of your resources. If you need to cut schedule or cut scope, uh, cut, cutting scope saves the health and the wellness of your team, um, which also puts you in a better position in future projects. So like I said, needing more or less of any of these elements, scope, 
resources or schedule will result in consequences in the other two, uh, very likely poor consequences. Um, and as I talked about a little bit earlier, uh, how easy or difficult it is to manage any of these elements might depend a little bit on your role on the team. Maybe you're here just because you know you come to all the workshops or you want to have a perspective on production, but you don't do production for your team. Um, you might be a designer or a developer and talking about cutting features might be really hard for you, especially on a game that you know you love uh, and you've worked on for a year. Um, but it might be a lot easier to go to your producer or go to a local organization and ask for more resources. That might be really easy because you prioritize those features and those uh, functionalities. But someone like me, for example, as a producer, uh, I might find it a lot easier to cut features because I'm not so um, absorbed in them. I'm not so, um, what's the word for this? I'm not so uh, involved in their kind of growth and therefore their death. Uh, I might find it easier to cut features, um, but a lot harder to find more resources because that is my job. I'm very embedded in resource management. Invested, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so that's kind of uh, an overview of the Iron Triangle. Obviously, if you do have any questions, um, clarifications, um, specific use cases on the Iron Triangle, please do drop them in chat. Again, we'll talk about those at the end. Uh, so then that brings us to organization. Um, so what exactly are we organizationing? What are we keeping organized? Well, that those iron triangles forces that we tracked uh, or that we talked about, um, resources, time, scope, sorry, resources, schedule, scope, um, those are kind of the three foundational things that you want to organize, that you want to keep track of as, as production. And that means tracking your tasks, your features, your milestones. That means tracking your team members, your costs and your finances and how, how much runway you have for your team. That also means tracking deadlines and feature priority, your task priority. Tracking all of those things will make sure that at least if you need to make a sacrifice in any of these corners of your triangle, you will see it coming because you will have that data in front of you. Um, some other details are definitely pertinent, um, and that said, they're usually related to or serve uh, one or more of these three forces. Sometimes you're tracking something like dependency, which in a way is related to all three things, scope, resources, and schedule. But that is the, the what of organization, and that uh, leads us to the how of organization. Um, this is a rabbit hole that I could talk about for ages, especially because even after only two years, I have many, many experience with uh, many, many tools. Uh, Aesthetician Labs, if you're curious, currently uses uh, Trello Business Class, uh, and we find that that works really, really well. Uh, we also use Notion kind of as a uh, peripheral tool. Um, we've also used Favreau in the past and moved away from that, um, but it certainly has its strengths. Uh, we also have some teammates that have used Jira on other teams, um, amongst other tools, but these are kind of the most notable ones. If your team doesn't already have a how of organization, um, there's definitely different strengths and weaknesses to different tools, and which one you pick depends a lot on your resources, uh, on your producer and team's preferences for how information is laid out, on how much money you want to spend, how flexible you need your tool to be. Um, to touch on information layout, um, having a good idea of how you want your information laid out comes mostly from experience, in my opinion. Um, Kanban boards being the thing that you often see in Trello, although there are also in tools like Fa Fabro and Notion, um, those allow for uh, the movement of tasks from left to right. And for a lot of people that might be really logical and that might be really helpful to see. Uh, it's, it's a very visual um, momentum almost of a task. Um, there's also tables and sheets though, which allow for a lot more information density. Uh, and there's also calendar, which it's, it's very tangible to see a calendar move from day one to day two to day three. Um, in terms of spending money on projects, uh, definitely for indie teams, this might be a bigger contention point than for, you know, 
a big uh, AA or AAA studio. Uh, but there's so, so many free tools out there. Um, when it comes to getting your team organized and making sure that you're tracking all your variables, please don't be daunted by uh, needing to pay money. It can be helpful, but it can very much be done for, for no cost up front. Uh, and in terms of flexibility, um, there is, it might sound like a, uh, like a con that there might be less flexibility in a tool like Trello or Fabro or Calendar. Um, but I do want to push back a little bit on that because something like Notion, a tool that has virtually infinite possibility and, and flexibility, uh, can be quite daunting, especially if you're just getting started in production or just getting started in project management. Having some constraints might be really helpful and really, really freeing in other regard by having limits in some. Kind of like a game jam. Um, if you come and there's a theme for you, um, it can sometimes be really helpful because it gives you a, a box to play in, essentially. Um, so these are just some of the factors. Uh, I certainly can't tell you what tools will be right for your project, for your team. Um, but if you are investigating how you want to stay organized, this is a great place to start in terms of what do you need from your tool and what exactly are you keeping track of? Um, something like Trello can track all of these things from tasks to feature priority, um, depending on how you manipulate your cards, for example. Um, but so can Notion, so can Calendar. Um, you will find when you start to use a tool that you will have questions that it can't answer until you make it answer them. So you might use labels or you might use calendar colors. Um, if you have specific questions about this, um, talking with your team and then um, reaching out to someone uh, is always kind of a good place to, uh, to start. That's really the, talk, the bulk of this talk uh, in terms of things that I knew I wanted to cover. Um, it did require a little bit of jumping around, so thank you for, for sticking with me if you're still here at this point. Um, I do want to point you to a couple resources that I know have really helped me, um, or at least one resource that really helped me, and that is uh, the bottom bullet point, Agile Game Development with Scrum by Clinton Keith. Obviously, we didn't talk about Agile today, but it just covered a lot of really important things when I was um, really starting to do academic study on production and it was relatively readable, so I do recommend it. But if you're looking for more of this kind of um, content that is easier to digest, um, I actually did a thesis of sorts for an independent, an independent study on games production uh, back in May, actually. Uh, and there was a live Q&A at the end with an industry producer uh, JV and with Rob Mostyn, our one and only uh, Rock Game Dev Rob Mostyn. It covers some of these methodologies uh, more in shallow than in depth, but um, it'll give you at least some idea if you're completely unfamiliar. But it also covers some of those other earlier topics like conflict uh, resolution, negotiation, vulnerability. And I do recommend you go give it a listen, especially because the Q&A was really insightful for me, even just at the time. Um, so this might be another good place to start if you're just getting started on production and have some other questions. Um, but other than that, I would love to answer your questions in chat if you do have any. Um, and if you have questions after this talk, you have elaborative questions, you have questions about your specific teams, your specific projects, I really, really encourage you to find me, ask me questions. Uh, you can find me on Discord at Sam underscore Camerata. You can email me at sam at uh, and you can DM me on Twitter, although no one's home at the moment. Uh, there it is, uh, Sam underscore Catamaran. That is all for today, uh, unless we have some questions. touch on a question that I did kind of reply to earlier, uh, but hockey goalie 78, um, mitigating scope creep while making sure that your game is iterative and incorporates playtesting feedback. Uh, I do think that that comes back to um, knowing the core tenets of your game. Uh, certainly you do want to incorporate feedback and the best way to do that while still maintaining your 
your scope and your resources other than knowing your core because knowing your core will tell you like um, which parts are most valuable to edit versus which parts aren't um, the best thing you can do is to plan iteration into your schedule is to plan iteration into your resource use um, so say you know we're gonna start introducing playtesting you know 80 percent of the way through the project or 70 percent of the way through the project uh, and we have the final 30 percent 50 percent of our time during that time is going to be dedicated just to incorporating feedback uh, tweaking based on uh, playtesting stuff like that um, if you don't allocate time when you first start thinking about the project and the, the timeline um, then yes you are gonna come up to the end of your project and say oh where did the time go I didn't have time for that um, that said there also has to be a line of I think having the an end date in mind having a finite schedule is also really helpful because even if you run over it it gives you a sense of all right well I can get infinite feedback I can get infinite you know ideas for this project but at some point it does need to come out um, I think part of um, what has helped me learn that is just by having to be in the role of production. Um, so I think on one person teams or on really small teams that don't have someone dedicated to that, that can certainly be harder. I'm not trying to say it's, it's easy, um, but factoring it into your schedule and keeping to a schedule as, as best as you can, I think is the best way to go there. What's the most difficult part about being a producer, at least from starting out? Um, Ooh. I think partially because I work on a, a really small team where we were all students when we started. Um, I didn't know what a producer was. Uh, and that sounds really silly. But I started doing production for our team when I still thought that I wanted to be a gameplay programmer, really. Um, I was in the game design development major at RIT at the time. Uh, I didn't know that I wanted to be a producer, but I fell really naturally into the role. Um, and the biggest difficulty was not knowing what I was supposed to be doing because I didn't know what production was. I didn't have anyone to look to. I didn't have any resources that I, could, I felt like I could fall back on. Um, it wasn't, I mean, I learned early on mostly through trial and error, big emphasis on error. Um, I made a lot of mistakes and I got a lot of constructive feedback from my team. I still do to this day and that is my primary me method of learning at this point. Um, and that was just the hardest thing was kind of coping with making lots of errors and not beating myself up too much for that because I didn't know what I was doing and I needed to have patience with myself. I needed my team to have patience with me as I learned. Um, it certainly got easier to be a producer <laughs> Uh, after I had some experience and then when I met mentors um, and when I started accumulating resources that I could look to um, that was a huge huge benefit uh, and that is part of why I do talks like this now and I try to be very vocal in the community about production because even if your team is only two people and you don't have someone who can be a dedicated producer at least having some of the foundational knowledge of production in the back of your head when you're starting to plan out a new project, I think can be a really key element to getting it to turn out really well. Thank you for the talk. You're welcome. Thank you for uh, being here, for sending along some questions. Uh, if anyone else does have questions, please feel free to drop them. We'll give it another minute or two. Um, pouring resources between bins is hard, like money versus things bought with money, like assets. Any advice there? This is hard. Budgeting for a team and managing um, how, where your money goes and re like reinvestment in your team uh, versus your assets like that's a really hard balance to strike um, I do most if not I do most of the financial kind of management for our team 
um, because in our team specifically, production means almost anything that isn't development or design. Um, we have found a lot of success with a model called Profit First, uh, which is just a specific way of budgeting. And we use a software that kind of has its own tenants called You Need a Budget. Um, I swear by both of those things, but they may or may not be relevant to you based on kind of, are you, you know, just you? Are you working? Are you worried about paying yourself? Um, in terms of general advice that I can offer without knowing your specific circumstance, um, it is to kind of keep in mind uh, the balance between security long term and the, the benefit, the value of things that you want, you might spend money on, like assets. Um, if an asset for your game costs $5, but saves you three hours of work, it might very well be worth it because, you know, your time is probably worth more than a dollar or something an hour. Um, but if an asset is $50 and only saves you three hours, then maybe it's not, maybe it's just worth your time to do that thing. Uh, it's having trouble determining the metric of how much time it takes to make something, for sure. <laughs> um, it can be really hard. Um, something that might help with that, something that our team does a lot is um, keeping data on how long things actually take so that you have reference points in the future. Um, and that is to say though, sometimes you just want an asset because you think that you know, maybe you could make something in a reasonable amount of time, but maybe the quality of that asset is just better than you feel like you could make. Um, at that point, it's just knowing your books. You know, how often are you bringing in income? How much are you willing to spend this month, for example? Um, if your work is generating your revenue, then the better quality your work can be and the more work you can do in a, in a given time, for example, uh, the more likely that revenue is to come in, if that makes sense. Um, so that asset might be worth it. Um, but if you only have $5 to your company's name, uh, then clearly you can't buy a $20 asset and maybe even buying a $5 asset would be a bad idea. Um, hopefully that kind of answers your question. Um, and I do see there's another question in here, perhaps a more general thing. What's been your favorite thing about being part of Aesthetician Labs? Um, this has been a really big uh, discovery process for me because we've been running Aesthetician Labs for about two and a half years now. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do <laughs> and like in college, beyond college, until we started the company. Um, and so especially early on, my favorite part has been just being in a space where I can learn as I go. Uh, not only how I do what I do, but why I do what I do. Um, at this point, a big part of my why is just the people that I work with. I, I believe in our mission, but more than that, I believe in um, the people that I'm working with, and it's just a joy to work with them every single day. So uh, that is a big part of, of what keeps me going on a day-to-day, -day, especially when I have hard things to do, and it's a big part of uh, why I continue to, to do them with the diligence that I do. Um, scanning through chat here. As Ayla's lead dev, a big consideration for me is the development cost of maintaining an internal tool versus the upfront cost of an asset with customer support. That's true. Um, definitely maintaining internal tools uh, is, is sneaky time away from your actual projects. Um, but it's also worth the trade-off of an asset at any time might stop having customer support. Uh, might become unsupported right when you need it the most. So um, not that introducing another variable to that uh, hard trade-off conversation is, is helpful, but it is certainly something that's valuable. Uh, do you have a particular process for evaluating and managing risk? Ooh, okay, good question. Um, I took a, a formal project management class back at RIT that talked a lot about risk. Um, and if I'm being completely honest, not that I like skimmed over this part, but it felt less relevant to me. So I definitely absorbed less of the information. 
Um, the way that I, and therefore Aesthetician Labs, manages our risk is more so on the on the broader scale of our portfolio. Um, we work on hyper-casual mobile games. We work on, we used to do some, some casual mobile games. We do board game ports to mobile. And we also do some non-mobile games. Um, broadly, our kind of risk assessment looks like how much time will this project likely take? And what is the reported, or what is the projected kind of payoff to that? Um, and then where are the pitfalls along the way, which usually turns into time spent. So um, working on a client project, one of the big risks is that it, it balloons in scope. Um, and we don't get appropriate uh, resource or schedule compensation for that inflate for that inflated scope. Um, and that's not to say that we don't take on client projects, but we have been very picky in the past about which clients we, we end up taking on because some clients have a higher propensity for um, scope demands than others do or for um, not wanting to give appropriate compensation for scope inflation. Um, for strictly internal projects, uh, risk assessment is a lot easier, specifically because of partially the market that we're in. Um, hyper casual as a segment of mobile games uh, is intended and is by design a relatively low risk market, which is part of what brought us there in the first place. Um, and we continue to work on it because it is relatively low risk in that we don't spend a lot of time on a project before it proves failure or does not prove failure, but at any point it can prove failure. And it's such a quick iteration process that we aren't wasting lots of time. Um, really large internal projects, which there's a reason we haven't done one in quite a while, um, they can be inherently much riskier than a mobile game, for example, because um, there is a lot more time between the first prototype, the first idea, and it proving unsuccessful. And that means a lot of time and money wasted in the interim. Um, that's not to say we'll never do a project like that, but we as a company aren't in a place right now where that amount of risk is appropriate to us. Um, our kind of capacity for timeline risk on a project. I think that varies from, from week to week, from month to month, as we look in our budget, as we look at our um, kind of projects lined up for the next quarter, the next year. Um, if we have a lot of money in the coffers for payroll and we have plenty of operating expenses saved up, then our risk becomes, or our capacity for risk becomes a lot fluffier versus if we're down to the wire, um, our willingness to risk for revenue might be higher, but our willingness to uh, risk on things internally might become a lot lower, if that makes sense. Um, like we aren't going to dump, you know, 400 hours into making a new asset store asset at, the, at this point, because we are looking for projects in the early part of next year. Um, it would be a much higher risk than to take on a client project, which will pay the bills in February. Um, what's your typical scope of project that you guys take on? So uh, take on in terms of client projects. Uh, we definitely tend to go for mobile games. Um, and our last project, which was Squire for Hire, uh, I believe that ended up taking about three and a half months, um, which was a little bit larger than we initially anticipated. I think we initially anticipated two and a half months. Um, I would say that that is relatively normal for us, uh, quote unquote. Um, I think the scope of which we are willing to kind of take on for client work really depends on, on who we're working with. Like, and like I said before, like, um, what is the payoff and the timeline? So if we really need you know, money for Q2 and Q3 of 2021, we might take on a larger project because we're like, well, we don't have a lot of work planned for that time. And the money that that project is offering would really help pay the bills for a long time. It's worth our time. Um, but if we have a game that's looking really good internally and we really wanna focus on that, uh, we might only be willing to accept client work that's much smaller in scope. 
Um, I understand that kind of that might not be applicable to a lot of teams um, and a lot of uh, larger project kind of coalitions, but that is at least how Aesthetician Labs balances it. Um, and that's the kind of conversation where um, I love to talk with individuals and teams one-on-one -on -one because it's always, every team's situation is gonna be unique in, in what kind of scope and what kind of risk is kind of the wisest to take on at any given moment, but it's a really fun conversation to try and balance. JB said that you were looking for a good metaphor analogy for product management. Did you ever find one you liked? Um, I'm trying to remember because something tells me we came relatively close at the end of, our, of my independent study, but it is completely uh, escaping me at the moment what exactly that was. Um, but I don't ever think I actually came to something or that JV and I together ever came to something that we loved, if I remember correctly. Uh, that's probably a really unsatisfying answer, but <laughs> that's uh, what it is I can remember at the moment. Noah said our, our hyper casual prototypes usually only take a couple of weeks to develop of development time too. Um, yeah, that's a really that's kind of a core tenant of Aesthetician Labs. If you're if you're unfamiliar, our turnaround time on our internal uh, ideas that usually prove failure uh, is really short, uh, and that means it's they're inherently low risk to their inevitable low payout. Um, but part of that industry, part of that market segment is also understanding that failure rate is high um, and finding a, a producer or I shouldn't say producer, finding a publisher or finding a support system that accepts a high failure rate and accepts a uh, low risk, high churn, as it were. Just skimming through the chat here, seeing if there's uh, anything I may have missed. Thank you so much to everyone who's been sending in questions. The business side of running a studio seems a bit scary to think about. It definitely is. Um, I, I won't even pretend to soften the blow on that one. It's very scary. Um, granted, uh, I am, uh, I've been sitting with that, with that scare, with that fear for two and a half years now. Um, and some days it doesn't feel that bad, but some days it's, it's very nerve wracking and it, and it doesn't really leave you. Um, <laughs> I think part of that was Aesthetician Labs formed as a, as a business during a time when I did not know anyone who was running a business uh, and when I did not know where to go, when I needed to ask for help. Um, not to say that it has gotten to the point where it's never scary, it's still sometimes a scary for sure, um, but after finding an accountant, after finding mentors, um, after talking with other people who run studios, who run small businesses, uh, the scary factor on the average day has gone down significantly. Um, and when it comes to running a business, I will always say I am not an expert for sure. Um, but if anyone ever has any questions or wants, you know, to talk about it and either make it less scary or, you know, seek some advice, quote unquote, um, I am always happy to chat about it because it is what I do for a living. And it is something that I, I love to talk about. Mentorship is massive, um, and I don't think we would have made it this far did we not have some really spectacular mentors as a team, and did I not personally, as our producer, have some really incredible mentorship, um, many of whom I found at RIT, um, but many of whom I also found here through Rock Game Dev and um, outside of all of those organizations. <laughs> well, if you guys are still doing well after a couple of years, we must be doing something right. Um, 
part of this is that we were students for the first while of our uh, existence and we didn't have to pay something like payroll. Um, but yes, we, I mean, knock on some wood way across the room. Um, we have not been sought out by the state or federal governments yet for doing something wrong. So I do like to think that we're doing something right. Um, <laughs> and so far so good. Um, yeah. It's definitely, it's, it's very scary. And at any point, things might get scarier. Um, but it's also been incredibly rewarding and I think it's been worth the scary factor. Um, very rewarding. <laughs> no, I said we're doing more right than just paperwork. That's true. Not to discredit our, our wonderful design and development teams. Uh, they're doing lots and lots of things right. Um, it's a great time to plug that if you ever want to hang out and see some of our design and development shops at work uh, every other Friday, Aesthetician Labs hosts co-working. Feel free to drop in and ask questions of any of us. All right. Uh, last call for questions, uh, but once again, uh, just in case we don't get any more, uh, pop my uh, contact info back here on the screen so that you can capture that. Um, oh, and my disclaimer, or my uh, heads up that slides uh, with links to resources, etc., cetera, uh, will be available uh, in the YouTube archive of this chat, which will presumably be up in the next 24 to 48 hours usually, especially with the holiday. I'm not sure if that's still accurate, but uh, this talk will be archived on YouTube uh, and in the description will be these slides. So you can access them in the future if you find them a, a useful reference for you. Ooh, okay, I see. Uh, so a more specific question to myself, if you don't mind. Don't mind at all, I love it, I encourage it. Uh, my project is getting around the end and needs porting to iOS, a trailer, final touches, playtesting, etc. Do you have any recommendations for the final stretch to make sure things go smoothly? Um, I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> Perhaps a lot of recommendations, um, although I have to kind of screen them because I don't have a ton of context for what exactly this project is looking like. Um, but yes, the final stretch. Um, I would say one of the key elements to making sure things go smoothly is kind of like we were talking about earlier, have a schedule. Even if you start, essentially start um, what is frequently called zero-based budgeting, um, in terms of your schedule, start zero-based. So from today, uh, completely forgetting everything that happened before this, um, what do I need to get done for this game to be considered complete? When do I want to have it done by? And work your way in between, filling in your features, filling in your scope, filling in your, with your resources, um, and adjusting from there. Um, having a cohesive plan, even if and when you deviate from it, having a cohesive plan to go back to and to keep maintained throughout the process, I think is the core tenant of making sure that things go as smoothly as they can. Um, Other kind of just like, I'm not your dad, but other recommendations I have are um, ask for help when you need it. You know, whether that is hiring, you know, someone to do some work for you or asking for friends to play test or whatnot. Like asking for help is a, is a really core tenant of things going smoothly because uh, you will very likely benefit from it and so will your project. Um, also, just like stay hydrated, drink water, um, taking care of yourself in the final stretch of a project, I think personally has been really hard because you get so wrapped up in the success of your project and in the uh, completion of the project because the, that end is finally in sight. It can be really easy to kind of overlook things that during the middle part of the project might have been a lot easier to find like self-care, uh, social time, etc., and so on. Uh, again, not your dad, but uh, 
some words of wisdom. Um, I'm making a casual mobile rhythm game if that helps at all. Um, yes. I mean, it's not to say that your timeline will be shorter because you have a mobile game, but um, it might be, in which case these like the end of a project can happen really fast and it can be kind of a, a whirlwind. Um, having things written down is definitely going to help keep track of everything. Uh, yeah, I have a general list of things I need to get done and I'm hoping to get it done over the break between semesters since that's like a month and a half. Yeah, so I mean, that's awesome because you already have kind of a built-in schedule um, and you already have a, a rough list. Uh, I think fleshing out that general list of things that you need to get done um, breaking them down into the tiniest pieces you can. So you mentioned um, one of the things that you know you need to do is a trailer. Um, if you need, if you're planning to do that trailer by yourself, um, you know, maybe each of these general things you need to have done is a bullet point. Break that bullet point of quote unquote a trailer into sub bullets of, okay, do I have all the programs I need? Maybe I need to download OBS. Maybe I need to watch a YouTube video on how to record, you know, gameplay footage, something like that. Um, not to say that these are things that you need to do, but maybe breaking them down further will help you schedule a lot more effectively. Um, and the same goes for if you need to hire someone, um, knowing, you know, maybe you need to do an hour of research just to find out where you're going to hire someone from and pick someone out. Uh, breaking things down into, into bite-sized chunks will make it a lot easier and less daunting, but also just help you schedule more effectively. Um, and I would also encourage you, if you're trying to get it done between semesters, to try and give yourself like a week at very minimum before the next semester starts to like rest and not actively work on a project. Um, just because I I only was in college for uh, a very short time while COVID was a thing, but um, it's very stressful. and. Working on a project can be really stressful. Being in school can be really stressful. Just giving yourself some time to have none of it was really, really helpful for me back in my time and I anticipate would be helpful for most other people. Um, so like sit down and write up everything essentially to define what resources scope schedule I have. Exactly. Um, this might be as simple as a Google Doc or as a Word document. Um, but it might actually be in a Trello board or it might actually be in any other you know, project management tool that you might choose from. Um, thank you for the advice. Of course. Um, and this is exactly the kind of thing where you're, you know, maybe you sit down and you work on it and you find that you're kind of stuck trying to cram everything in. Um, do feel free to ping me on Discord, ping me via email. Um, you know, I love to, to chat about this stuff more in depth and we can probably get a little bit more into the sticks if you have more questions uh, in one-on-one. -on -one. Taking time off before the semester as a team was super helpful when Ayla was still in school. In 200%, 300%. Um, you know, Ayla is taking a three plus week vacation here in December um, into January. Um, we are a huge proponent of, of rest um, even when we're not in school. Uh, and I would, you know, whatever kind of flexibility you have, I encourage everyone to, to find similar amounts of rest or uh, similar quality of, of rest whenever you can. And I'm trying to take a couple days now just to relax because my brain has been fried from the semester. I feel that. We're in the final home stretch of kind of preparing our business for, for the end of the year. Um, I feel like my brain is toasted at the end of every day. Um, and so making sure that my rest time in between days is as impactful as possible, that my weekends are as restful as possible, um, it's all super, super important. Business finals, exactly. I mean, this is like the, it's more like business midterms because tax season is really your finals. But uh, practicing as much as you can is the best thing you can do. All right. I think with that, I'm going to call it good. Thank you so, so much to everyone who sent in questions, um, to uh, tuned in for the chat. Uh, super excited uh, to see all of the projects coming out of Rock Game Dev and happy to uh, hopefully provide some resources in the management of current and future projects. 
Uh, Hockey Goalie 78, I see you. You're welcome for the presentation. It was my pleasure. Uh, obviously, again, please feel free to ping me on Discord, on email. Probably not on Twitter, but you can if you want to. I'll check in eventually. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you all online and eventually offline uh, in the future. All right.